multinational ways to protect the foundational concept of open access, we enhance trust and diminish suspicion. And it's being operationalized right now as I speak during our RIMPAC exercise where 26 nations are working together to find ways to enhance the global security architecture. Good morning. Think about what we My name is Amy Larson and I'm a graduate student at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and NYU Law. I'm also honored to be a 2016 Aspen Security Forum Scholar. I'm particularly excited to introduce our next panel, The Fight for Geopolitical Supremacy in the Asia Pacific. As I have lived and worked in Asia for several years and find the region's challenges and opportunities fascinating. Will China's economic slowdown, signs of political instability, and Western military push pushback give China pause? Or will it double down in the race for regional hegemony? What is and what should be the role of other regional actors? Is a fight for geopolitical supremacy inevitable? Or might there be a less contentious vision for geopolitical balance in the Asia Pacific? Moderating this session and surely helping us to solve all of these questions is Gordon Lubold, who is well up to the task. Gordon has covered the military and national security for more than 15 years and is now the Pentagon reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Prior to this position, he launched and authored three different national security newspapers, including the Situation Report, which is read by 150,000 readers each morning. That would be all of us and whoever else is watching on live stream. Uh, he has covered conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, and has reported on military matters in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. The floor is yours, Gordon. Thanks so much. Uh, great to be here. Um, so as we, and I'm glad everybody's here, I think the, the mountain trails begin to beckon for a lot of people, but it's great to have everybody here. Um, uh, I think um, as we kind of start to wrap up the forum the, the last few days, all these great conversations, we would be remiss if we did not talk about the U.S.-China relationship broadly um, you know, say what you will about the uh, Asia pivot, um, or if I'm being politically correct, the rebalance. Um, uh, I think that the events of the last year or so uh, reinforce the, the importance of this region. I think the gentleman to my uh, right would both probably have long since agreed with that anyway. Um, uh, it's, you know, we've got the, the uh, rising threat uh, from North Korea, we have a rising military in China, we have various uh, issues at, at play. Um, I think, you know, when you talk about U.S.-China, the elephant in the room is going to be, for now, uh, this dispute that we've all heard about in the South China Sea, um, especially with the ruling earlier this month um, from The Hague. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do today is just kind of briefly, in the, in the brief time we have, is uh, talk broadly about this relationship, but perhaps uh, kind of peg it, uh, peg the discussion a little bit to some of these issues surrounding the South China Sea, but also keep it, keep it broad. Because I think uh, those of us in the media, some in Congress, even policymakers, look at the South China Sea dispute uh, maybe sometimes too closely, don't see the, the bigger picture. And I think these guys will both uh, help us um, uh, understand the broader issue. So um, I'm going to have them speak. By the way, I took some notes on my phone. I'm not checking my email as we uh, go. Um, but I want to introduce uh, both of these two gentlemen briefly. To my far right, Ambassador Scheer uh, was recently appointed to the Secretary of Defense to perform the duties of the Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense. Uh, congratulations. After his stint as, as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian Pacific Security Affairs. Um, a career diplomat who has served throughout Asia, his last State Department assignment was ambassador to Vietnam. He is a first degree rank in Kendo, something I didn't know until I saw this bio, and he speaks Japanese, Chinese, and intermediate Pentagon. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll look for some, for, for, for some uh, uh, deciphering there. Uh, uh, Jonathan Pollack is the interim SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korea Studies uh, in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and Senior Fellow 
in the John Thornton China Center at Brookings, a specialist on East Asian international politics and security. He has published extensively on Chinese political military strategy, the political and security dynamics of the Korean Peninsula, U.S.-China relations, uh, and U.S. strategy and policy in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you both gentlemen for being here today. Um, so with that, uh, Ambassador Shear, why don't you just jump in and give us a little five-minute uh, issue of where you sit and how you see the world, and we'll get to it. Sure. Thank you very much, Gordon. Let me start by addressing the topic of this panel, which is the fight for geopolitical supremacy in East Asia. And I have to say that as a diplomat with a lot of experience in East Asia, I've had to approach the region with a bit more nuance throughout my career. It's an extraordinarily complicated region. Uh, and our relationship with China is extraordinarily complicated. We have uh, a relationship that is defined by both cooperative and competitive elements with China. We cooperate where we have common interests, as with climate change and Iran, for example. And we work with the Chinese in very candid uh, and sometimes difficult ways in areas where we disagree. And all of those uh, elements of the relationship have been on display recently, uh, most prominently during uh, National Security Advisor Rice's visit to Be Beijing, where she uh, worked with the Chinese to prepare for the upcoming G20 summit in China. Uh, she met with President Xi, with State Councilor Yang Jiechi, and a variety of other senior uh, uh, Chinese officials, including the Vice Chairman of the uh, Military Commission, Fan Changlong. So, um, her discussions with the Chinese covered the whole range of topics from where we cooperate in climate change and the, the global financial system to where we disagree on the South China Sea. She had an extremely candid discussion uh, with her Chinese counterparts on the South China Sea, as well as on issues like our deployment of the THAAD uh, uh, ballistic missile defense battery to uh, South Korea. So this is an extraordinary complicated region. Uh, we approach it uh, uh, implementing the most vigorous diplomacy we can, and that's a diplomacy that's backed by our very, very capable uh, military forces throughout the region. And that's what you've seen uh, in connection with uh, our approach to the South China Sea since last year, a very vigorous, strong diplomacy backed by uh, uh, operations of the Seventh Fleet in particular uh, throughout the South China Sea and the region as a whole. And all of this we put in the context of the rebalance, which is an effort uh, to ensure that East Asia gets the kind of attention, the kind of resources uh, uh, this growing uh, and important region deserves. And in the Department of Defense, that means ensuring that we have the right posture throughout the region, that we have the right level of forces, that they are, are uh, arrayed in a resilient way and a politically sustainable way, um, and, and that they are used in ways not only that uh, deter uh, aggression and adventurism, but reassure our allies, support our diplomacy, and in the case of the South China Sea, uh, encourage restraint among the claimants. Why don't I stop there? Um, I think David has given a very, very good introduction uh, to the way the United States tries to shape its policy here. I think it's important at the outset, uh, David unfortunately only arrived late last night, so he hasn't been here for our discussions over the last uh, two or three days, uh, which has gone from one grim domain to another, um, uh, both geopolitical, cyber, terrorist, you name it, we've covered it. So when I look at the world, and if I look at locations of strategic consequence, uh, in a relative sense, uh, East Asia looks much better than anything else. Um, you know, and we'd like to keep it that way. So the question is this, uh, obviously, what does this require of us? What does it require of others, including China? But being mindful uh, this morning when I was thinking about this, that uh, if I could quote Mark Twain when he talked about yes, Wagner's music, that it's not as bad as it sounds. So uh, <laughs> with, with that, in, because let's recognize that this extraordinarily diverse region, many of the countries of this region have sustained um, economic advancement almost unparalleled in human history. 
Um, there is, in a number of societies, much more openness about governance and the like, not across the board by any means. Uh, a lot of issues are raised here about China, understandably so, given the kind of long-term strategy that administration after administration has pursued. Um, I might note, although um, it's not, I suspect, a major theme of our discussions this morning, but I would be remiss if I did not notice that as we look at the rebalance policy, uh, it presumably is a three-legged stool. It's security-related, it's political-related, and it's economics-related. But right now, um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is in some genuine jeopardy. And if this is to be the way in which, in part, the United States was trying to formulate and pursue uh, a, a strategy for the longer term about the conditions that would govern uh, commerce and investment, uh, this, the question now that emerges is what happens if, in fact, this kind of mood that has been created in the, in the presidential campaign uh, persists into 2017 and beyond. So with that as opening comments, I'll stop. Got it, great. Um, so I have a few questions, but I would say to all of you, I really do want this to be a conversation. Um, often your questions are better than mine. Uh, so I'm gonna have a few questions and then I'm gonna get, uh, uh, we'll kind of go back and forth here a little bit. But one thing, which again, the elephant in the room is this ruling uh, that I hope you could both speak to, July 12th from The Hague, um, which I think surprised some people in its kind of sweeping uh, uh, indictment of China's activities. Um, maybe more so than anybody else mm -hmm. kind of even expected. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it sounds like we're in kind of a period of quiet. But as I was saying uh, earlier, somebody said to me this morning, like, don't, don't be, uh, um, don't think that this means that China has made some kind of fundamental decision. Anyway, uh, kind of my basic question is what now? The ruling, and uh, David, you want to take that first? Sure, well, the ruling really was extraordinary, and it did four things. First of all, it ruled that the Chinese 9 dash claim, claim is not consistent with the law of the sea. The second thing it did was that it, um, it declared, or it judged that the features in the South China Sea at most generate only 12 nautical mile territorial zones. Uh, the third thing it did was uh, rule that the Chinese have infringed on Philippine rights by interfering with uh, Philippine uh, fishing activities. And the fourth thing it did was that the ruled, it ruled that the Chinese were in violation of their obligations under the law of the sea uh, in damaging, uh, in, in committing the environmental damage that they, uh, they committed when they reclaimed territory uh, on those South China Sea features. This was a broad, very deep uh, 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 and conclusive ruling uh, uh, in favor of the Philippine uh, case. Uh, the Chinese reaction initially was very sharp. It followed uh, along the lines they had been using since the case was first filed with the, uh, the uh, Law of the Sea Tribunal. Uh, the Chinese, in, act in their actions, however, I think have been uh, uh, relatively uh, dialed down. Um, they, ha they have been uh, relatively moderate in their interactions with us. They have been moderate in seeking uh, diplomatic interaction with Philippines. Um, and I think generally they've showed restraint uh, on the water around the South China Sea features. So, and these are all activities that we encouraged uh, throughout the year, both within our engagements with the Chinese, but also with our engagements with the, the ASEAN claimants. We uh, engaged in a, in a pretty uh, determined, uh, we implemented a pretty determined diplomatic strategy uh, beginning early this year, in which, which was looking toward the tribunal decision, in which we encouraged the claimants to take the, 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 the decision and use it first as a way of delimiting their claims and better defining their claims, and secondly, as an opportunity to conduct some constructive diplomacy with regard to the South China Sea, not raise tensions. And I think in the overall reaction of the claimants, as well as the reactions of the Chinese and the Philippines, what we're seeing is uh, the start, what could be the start of some constructive diplomacy 
in the region. Of course, we're going to watch it very, very uh, carefully, and we're going to keep our uh, forces in the region, um, as I said earlier, to continue to deter adventurism, to continue to reassure particularly our ally, the Philippines, and to encourage restraint on the part of all the players in the region. Um, if I, I think David, again, has very, very aptly described where things are. Uh, at, a, at a minimum, we are at a moment of pause. And the question would be, does this reflect uh, in any meaningful sense a degree of reassessment or lessons learned on the part of the Chinese? Because there's no doubt that the ruling in The Hague was extraordinary in its scope and in its sweep. Uh, now, some of you are probably wondering what this infamous nine-dash line is or is not. Um, interestingly enough, the Chinese have never told us. Um, the the nine-dash line derives originally from an 11-dash line formed by a cartographer under the Republic of China. Uh, in, that is when uh, the Chinese nationalists ruled the mainland um, in 1947. But now they've adopted this as their own with some slight modifications that, if anything, extend it out a little farther. But there has always been this ambiguity, which, frankly, may be one of the reasons why the Chinese, from the first time that the Philippines filed the case in 2013, uh, just, just refused to have anything to do with it and claim, at least in their declarations now, that they will continue to not recognize it. If there's good news in this story, though, uh, it's that, uh, and, and let me, I should have noted that originally Ambassador Tsui Tiankai uh, was to be with us today. Um, he went to China, actually, I guess, with Susan Rice, uh, and uh, I guess is still in Beijing at this point. Um, if, if he were here, and let me just suggest, and it's not an advertisement for him, but uh, if you're curious about how an informed Chinese describes uh, the ruling and its aftermath, uh, Ambassador Tsui gave a very forceful speech at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, the, I think the day of or the day after the ruling, uh, and that will impart a flavor of how China uh, is reacting and responding. But what has not happened to this point are a lot of the worst case assessments that are being offered. Uh, uh, or proposed, some by strategists abroad, some suggested in the Chinese blogosphere and so forth. Uh, they run the gamut from China should withdraw from, the, uh, from the, uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, China should declare an air defense identification zone, uh, China should declare straight baselines, um, in, the, in these islands, the, Spra the, uh, the Sproutleys, or Nanshas as they are called uh, in Chinese, um, and, and even extend out or, or in, and do other forms of punishment. Um, none of this has happened, uh, and it does suggest that at one level at least, beyond all the fierce words of denunciation of the agreement, uh, the Chinese are not immune to a certain level of reason and judgment. Some of this may be related to the fact that uh, China will host the G20 in Nanjing in early September. That's a big deal for President Xi Jinping. Uh, presumably, he would like it to be as orderly as possible. Uh, and uh, that may be one factor that inhibits them for now. But, but over the longer run, it raises the whole issue of whether China is prepared to live and cooperate fully in a world where some things don't go the way they want them to go. Uh, and it's a very big question about China, not only China's relations with its neighbors, but also China's broader support for what we'll call international order as a whole. Um, maybe we can come back to this in, in subsequent yeah, yeah, sure. discussions. Uh, um, so I just come back to what the U.S. Uh, kind of reaction probably should best be. Mm -hmm. Again, I know that the uh, media, myself included, <laughs> sometimes fixate on this idea of FONOPs. For those of you who don't necessarily track, um, uh, I had to ask a FONOP question. Um, uh, FONOPs are freedom of navigation operations that the U.S. does around the world. Uh, they have, are, are, are particularly uh, interesting in this uh, region now. Uh, but my kind of question is, you know, to fawn up or not to fawn up now, um, uh, what are the risks of provocation, especially given this kind of pause? Mm -hmm. What is the risk of, of uh, not doing anything uh, and not sending and sending maybe a, a different message again, David? Sure. 
Sure, just to. And, oh, and by the way, I just want to sorry. Um, if I can get through this, <laughs> if this uh, panel, I will win as a moderator. If I, if I, if we avoid the um, frequent talking point of uh, uh, what is it? No, no, no. Sail, nav sail, navigate, oh. or now I'm going to screw it. I'm getting there. I know. I, <laughs> I, was, I knew he would get it. So anyway, go ahead. Just a reminder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just to further define freedom of navigation operations, these are oper operations that the U.S. Navy conducts not only in East Asia but globally, and they're designed to demonstrate our commitment to freedom of navigation as well as to challenge excessive maritime claims made by other countries. So you'll, in, in, a, in a naval FANOP, you'll see a U.S. warship basically challenging um, excessive maritime claims, sometimes by going through a 12-mile, a claimed 12-mile territorial zone. And we have conducted FONOPs quite regularly in the South China Sea on features claimed not only by China, but by other claimants as well. And these FONOPs have become the focus of a lot of public attention. Uh, and when and That's where right. we're going to do that. Well, Mr. Chairman, it's very difficult for me to comment to any degree of specificity on potential future hypotheticals. That's not, well, we, we need to, don't we need to know I mean, don't, don't we need a strategy to be able to answer those kind of questions or, I mean, are we saying we don't have a position uh, based on the Department of Defense right now as to whether or not there's any military significance there and if it does have military significance uh, as to whether or not it would impact our national security interest? Well, Mr. Chairman, as I said, that the, the military significance of Scarborough is, is not intrinsic to the feature itself, but rather what would be in place upon it. Um, so it's difficult for me to react, um, to, um, to guess as how it would react because there's such a wide degree of variability. Is there anything you could tell us as to what would constitute the militarization of Scarborough Shoals? Um, militarization is not a term um, that um, we've used. The, the term was introduced, as, as you know, sir, um, during, a, during diplomatic exchanges with the Chinese. Um, we um, look to resolve these issues uh, through diplomacy. I understand. Um, we want everybody to take a breath and be calm, but at some point in time, they don't always do that. And so if, if we were to have a situation, they say they're not going to militarize those islands. Um, if they were to militarize those islands, would that be uh, contrary to the national security interest of the United States? Um, again, sir, I think it's, it's too, uh, the, the variability in, in what could be uh, so the, the Department of Defense, through you, can't give us an opinion as to whether or not you think the militarization of the Scarborough Shoal would be against the national security interests of the United States? Um, in terms of, you asked me, sir, you, what I can comment upon is the, the military implications of this. Okay. Um, and in terms of military implications, as I said, um, the variability um, based on what could be in place on, on any of these features is extremely broad. Um, and so, therefore, it's difficult for me to, to um, hypothesize about how we may react or respond to what may be put on any one of these features. Okay. Let me ask you this, then. The 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty binds the United States and the Philippines were bound to respond to attacks on the armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft of the other party, as well as island territories under its jurisdiction. Um, has the United States... Um, or uh, either through the Department of Defense or uh, the State Department even made an analysis of whether or not it thinks the Scarborough Shoal um, is an island territory under the jurisdiction of the Philippines? Well, sir, I, uh, uh, treaties tend to be, uh, the specific meaning of treaties tend to be handled by the State Department. So let me, before I turn things over to okay. my colleague, let me just say, as, as, as I've said in my written testimony, as, as um, Des Willett mentioned in her uh, um, in her statement, um, that we are, um, iron, we retain an ironclad commitment to the defense of our allies, and that's something that we'll. Uh, the bells and whistles approach here, where the Secretary of Defense, in a very very visible way, um, is on the carrier. Uh, it's not as if the Chinese aren't going to, are going to not fail to yes. notice that there's a carrier uh, in these waters. Um, I don't want to suggest it's the equivalent of doing a touchdown dance in the end zone, uh, but, but 
you know, I would favor to use another athletic metaphor, but just it's, it should be the Nike strategy. Just do it. Uh, uh, don't lather it up. I mean, having established this, having seen the ruling in The Hague, which clearly the United States has uh, strongly endorsed, uh, and that this, in my view, would be much more sufficient because if the intention is to, as David said, deter the Chinese from doing other things, that might be the case. Uh, that might, it might be succeeded in that respect. But let's also recognize that there's a lot of divided counsel in China. And uh, a presence and a posture that, at least as I might see it, looks a bit excessive or a bit too demonstrative uh, may, in fact, validate the views of some of exactly those people in China that you don't want to validate. That's a very subtle combination because it's a reminder. It's not only decisions that China takes, but how China evaluates and perceives what, what we do. Uh, so it's really an argument here for being careful about how we proceed. We can be unequivocal in our judgments. Let's also recognize, by the way, that, and I'm not going to repeat those magic words because they don't come trippingly off my tongue. I guess when, when you work in the five-sided big building, you get, that's the test. You have to be able to say them uh, very, very quickly right, right, right off the I tip failed. of your tongue. Yeah. Um, but um, the Chinese object uh, to other aspects of this beyond the question of freedom of navigation that you know, the Chinese insist there is no threat to freedom of navigation. China is the world's biggest trading state. Uh, the argument would be China, the last thing China would want to do is impede any kind of commercial operations and so forth. Where the Chinese draw their own line or they state their own objections is a lot of these are near in, uh, so, not the carrier as such, but some of these operations are very, very near in. They're there for surveillance activities, intelligence gathering activities. Uh, I remember very specifically that on one of these operations where uh, uh, Admiral Harris, head of Pacific Command, um, took a CNN crew in on a U.S. Uh, P-8 aircraft. Um, I demur from that. I mean, I just don't get it, what is accomplished by hyping all of this. But then that feeds the narrative. Uh, but the narrative can come back and, under some circumstances, bite you in ways that you might not like. Um, I want to get to the audience, but one uh, kind of a policy political question. Um, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned the G20 is coming up. The uh, Chinese have a heavy interest in having this be a successful event, and maybe it will be, uh, maybe that will uh, mute their reaction for now. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also keenly aware of our own American political transition. Um, both of you but, uh, either can jump in, but uh, what should the what can or should the U.S. signal be uh, be to the Chinese now to say, you know, we got it, we're going through a transition. It's a perfect opportunity for the Chinese to maybe stir the pot a little bit, but it's all the more important that they perhaps they don't. I mean, is there a way to communicate that effectively and get them to understand that? Well, I think President Obama. Uh, in his interactions with the Chinese, as well as National Security Advisor Rice, have both uh, made it very clear that they want a successful G20, and that management of uh, all of the issues between us, including the hard ones uh, between now and then, will be one element uh, that uh, goes into a successful G20. So we, we've been making that very clear to the Chinese. I, I think, if, if, if I could, and I think, Part of it is what we are able to convey authoritatively on a private basis. Um, I had a discussion not so long ago with a very, very distinguished, uh, now retired Chinese diplomat. I'm not going to name his name. But he pointed out to me, he says, the danger in a lot of diplomacy, and a lot of this really is diplomatic, um, is the lock-in effect of words. When states have declared this or that, they can't retract the words, number one, and they feel that for the credibility of their stance, they can't pull back from this. Right? The argument he was making is that when, and again, he's defending China, understandably, he's saying, when you, the United States, do X, Y, and Z, we are then compelled to respond. Now, that's a little too easy, but I understand his point. Um, so much of what is going on here reflects 
and, I, and I'm not trying to take this back and sort of say, you know, where is their original sin here? But so much of this reflects the fact that China today, now, has invested major resources in becoming a much more consequential military power. Um, it has the ability for the first time in its post-1949 history to extend that power outward uh, from the mainland of China. They're still pretty new at this. Um, we'd hope that this could be done in a way that does not put peace at risk. Um, uh, but it's, in part, it's these growing pains, if you will, as China resumes what it sees as its rightful and legitimate place as a global power, uh, a regional power first and then ultimately a global power. We know they have global reach in terms of their economic performance in all kinds of ways, um, but this is now something that directly confronts us and China uh, with how do you establish rules of the road under circumstances where China now also has capacities they didn't have before. The ones who feel this first obviously are China's neighbors. And, you know, uh, China over the last few years, given a lot of its conduct uh, in the South China Sea, they have kicked the ball into their own goal repeatedly. Uh, and maybe we should say, well, let them continue to kick the ball into their own, own goal. But, you know, the question is whether or not by what we do credibly, consistently, and privately to convey your real concerns, uh, your, the real issues that you have, and I think we have done that, uh, is really the most important element. Uh, in effect, don't, don't, uh, don't get the megaphone out too much uh, in a public way, but make sure that they grasp this in a very private way. Good. I have other questions, but I want to open it up here and maybe come back. So, microphones, I guess. I saw the man in the bright red shirt first. Uh, Charlie Richards from Delaware. My question is, how do we uh, persuade, or is a better word, or pressure uh, China to be more help uh, to us with respect to North Korea. North Korea seems to be uh, a very serious uh, uh, threat, and uh, it's said that uh, China could, but hasn't yet been persuaded to do much with respect to restraining the North Koreans. What should our policy be? What should we be saying or doing to uh, China to get them to be more active? Great question. If I may. Yeah. Uh, well, our general approach to North Korea is characterized by a diplomatic approach as well as the application of pressure. We're certainly willing to engage the North Koreans in a diplomatic uh, dialogue designed to achieve a non-nuclear Korean peninsula. But in order for us to do that, the North Koreans have to demonstrate a serious commitment to denuclearization. They haven't done that yet. In the absence of a diplomatic dialogue, pressure counts. Uh, and we have most recently brought pressure to, to bear through uh, a UN Security Council resolution uh, passed by the Security Council after the January, the fourth Janu uh, nuclear North Korean nuclear test in January. This is uh, a very strong uh, Security Council resolution, which goes to, to the heart of some of the things North Korea is doing internationally, including their banking activities. So this resolution goes beyond previous resolutions and strengthens the pressure on North Korea. The Chinese were quite cooperative in Security Council deliberations on this um, uh, resolution, and we've seen Chinese efforts to implement that resolution since. So we, uh, we engage the Chinese at the senior most levels on this subject, the North Korea problem is among the highest uh, uh, items on our bilateral agenda, um, and we, we don't, we never uh, miss an opportunity to discuss it with the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese have their own interests in, at, uh, at times. They're interested in, uh, very interested and concerned about stability in North Korea. They're concerned that uh, should there be instability in North Korea, uh, North Korean refugees will flood across their border. So they have uh, interests that are sometimes slightly different from ours. 
but they do cooperate with us in applying the pressure we need to apply in order to bring North Korea, North Korea around. It's a long-term effort. It's not going to be, it's not going to happen overnight. And there's more to be done, both in terms of applying pressure and I think in conducting diplomacy as well. You can jump in if you want, sure. or yeah. we can move on. Uh, yeah, I, only to say this, it's um, our turn to look at Northeast Asia now, uh, that, uh, by your question, is, is very, very important. Because in my own view, the real strategic stakes, true strategic stakes, are in Northeast Asia, not however important the reefs and shoals and the conditions governing what they are or what they are not uh, pale by comparison. Uh, we fought a war uh, with China uh, on the Korean Peninsula in the 1950s. Um, when President Nixon um, went to China in 1972, he had an extraordinary exchange with then Prime Minister Zhou Enlai and where Nixon made abundantly clear, you know, we fought a war here once and we must never let it happen again, period. But here's the problem. Um, North Korea, uh, it's, it, 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 we talked about it yesterday, uh, it's, it's defiant. Uh, you would think on paper China would have an enormous capacity to dictate what North Korea should do. It's not that easy. It's never been that easy with North Korea. But I think that the Chinese are moving in a direction that we clearly do uh, encourage. Uh, Xi Jinping cannot abide Young Kim. Um, but they haven't translated that fully, or maybe not in a way in the visible kinds of ways often we want to see. But as David has noted, um, I do think that they are the, the, these sanctions have much more bite. Uh, and um, so we're, we're nudging things in the direction. Uh, China has an enormous commitment to South Korea. Um, uh, trade relations, investment relations, they understand there's a Korea that really works with them and one that defies them. And it's not because North Korea is some kind of um, uh, glorious strategic asset for China. It's not. It's an enormous burden and a risk and a liability. So um, it's, this is going to be slow, steady, persistent work uh, if we are going to advance goals that are not only in our interest, but very much in China's interests. Over the longer run, there are issues of North Korea's long-term future, but let's put that to one side for Let's uh, I see John in the back there, uh, uh, right there, um, and maybe let's do some kind of quick hot rounds here, because I think we're running out of time here mm -hmm. soon. So John. Uh, John McLaughlin, uh, Johns Hopkins University. Actually, I had two questions, but I'll just use one since you're down Thank on you. time. Um, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the new Silk Road or One Belt, One Road proposals. Do you see these as proposals? They strike me as rather transformative in their ambitions, mm -hmm. uh, impressively so. Uh, are they mounted for China's sake, period, and the region? Or are they, in some sense, do you think, competitive with us uh, and to, to kind of challenge us in some way? Um, try to be quick. So I'll, I'll try to be quick. I mean, the, for those who don't aren't familiar with it, it's 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 uh, Xi Jinping has articulated the idea that both in maritime routes and in overland routes, uh, China would play this enormous role across Asia, going to Europe uh, to cement these ties and bonds, but putting enormous assets, financial and otherwise, uh, into developments in a lot of cases in some pretty dangerous territory, um, which begs the whole issue of whether China is going to be capable of taking on other kinds of roles if things don't go according to plan. But the, the bank itself, I mean, this is this fundamental question that it, the Chinese have defined the bank. It's a multilateral institution they've created. There's lots of foreign membership in it. The US and Japan and Canada decided to stay out and not be founding members of the bank. But in a lot of ways, it's sort of, you would think, the kind of China you want to encourage over time. Uh, I don't think it was particularly well handled uh, in the US government. I think it's recognized now that it was not. Um, but it's, it's more you want China to be supplementing uh, rules uh, established in the existence of other uh, international banks and the like, uh, and to do this in a way that will undoubtedly, I think, benefit Chinese interests 
but at the same time uh, will accord with the, a larger set of needs uh, in the international system. Okay. Uh, this guy here, please. How about, how about you ask a quick question, and then I, I'm trying to get a quick the guy in the green shirt here, please, sir. Mark Mabry, uh, Director of the National Cybersecurity FFRDC at MITRE. Question is, uh, we had China attack us, according to the Congress, in the third PLA in 2014, against U.S. Transcom. They've robbed our country uh, very significantly, measured in certainly hundreds of, of billions, maybe trillions. Um, things have changed. The White House has negotiated some new cyber norms. Don't attack our cyber emergency response teams. Don't attack... Um, don't use our intelligence apparatus to attack us. Seems to have some diminution of attack, but uh, to your point, David, about competition versus collaboration, um, are they going to not be able to resist uh, getting at our IP, getting at our critical infrastructure, and fighting a, uh, if you will, a, a non-traditional war against us? Thanks. And then uh, if we could go to the gentleman in the green chair. There we go. Bruce Berger. Uh, all these conversations on Asia... The word Japan has not come up at all. And where do they fit in the equation and remilitarization of Japan? Let me address the Japan question first. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the rebalance forms our overall approach to the region. Um, and the rebalance doesn't just include uh, uh, the movement of American military hardware. Uh, it involves uh, a lot of so uh, improvements in the software as well, and, and th that software includes the strengthening of our alliances. And of course, Japan is, our alliance with Japan remains fundamental to peace and stability in the region. So we've been working with the Japanese, particularly since the, the, their uh, revision of their national security laws, which sort of uh, gives them more opportunities to operate with us. We've been working with them very closely to uh, tr plan, train, and operate together uh, in, in ways that we haven't done before. And this is, again, this is a major piece of the rebalance. Um, and it will continue to contribute greatly, I think, to uh, regional stability as well as to our efforts throughout the region. On the subject of the cyber, this is a major concern uh, on the part of the administration, particularly uh, in the run-up to President Xi's visit to Washington last year. And we made this, uh, arriving at a, a, a cyber agreement with the Chinese uh, among the highest priorities of that visit. Um, we think we got a good uh, start at, at a way of dealing with the Chinese on this subject. Um, you've probably seen some private uh, cybersecurity firms uh, uh, state publicly that Chinese intrusions have uh, f decreased. Um, we're going to continue to watch this very closely, uh, even as we uh, implement that agreement. And of course, we're going to take uh, maximum steps to ensure that our government cyber uh, uh, capacity is secure. Um, let me just make a couple of comments about, uh, about Japan. Um, the Chinese, of course, have have made a lot of overwrought comments about, quote unquote, remilitarization of Japan. Uh, in fact, Japan is challenged in all kinds of fundamental ways. Their economy has been f basically flat for uh, the better part of two decades or more. Um, uh, their forces are small, although, although certainly very, very uh, capable. Uh, Abe, uh, certainly a man with a, a, big, a bigger vision, uh, is trying to direct this in a way that he thinks he can revive Japan's economic fortunes, but he wants to do this at least tethered very, very closely to the United States. The question is why? And I think it's because in Japan there is free-floating anxiety about the longer term because you have Japan, it's a very rapidly aging population, it's beginning to shrink, uh, and that long-term concern that Japan has always had has come to the fore a much more capable China uh, that, it, that Japan or some in Japan worry about uh, threats that it poses to J Japan's security and well-being. What the Chinese and others, and the others here in this case would include our South Korean allies, um, are uncomfortable with uh, is the extension of our 
our security relationship with Japan that goes into new domains, as, da as David had just noted. So even as we are looking for help wherever we can get it, uh, the question is the basis on which this will be conducted, how extensive will Japan's involvements be, uh, and whether or not, frankly, over the longer term, Japan and China both can come to a tolerable set of understandings uh, in, as they are immediate neighbors uh, and f I don't want to say peacefully coexist, but the implications if they can't uh, are going to be extraordinary and worrisome. And on that basis, I would take away what I said about Wagner's music. <laughs> That's a good one. Gordon, uh, Gordon, I know we have no more time, but I just want to make a very brief plug for something Jonathan said earlier, and that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Trans-Pacific Partnership will not only benefit the partners economically, it's strategic. And our TPP partners understand this acutely. It's strategic because it will give countries like Vietnam uh, a much broader diversity in their trading relationships. Um, and this will benefit them, not only economically, but strategically, and it will benefit us economically and strategically as well. And that's why Secretary Carter has been out at, uh, and at every uh, opportunity in public has, has uh, voiced very strong support for TPP because we in DOD believe that uh, it will be an important signal for the region, not just economically, Absolutely. but strategically as well. Unclear if Donald Trump's on board, but anyway. <laughs> um, hey, uh, thanks. Maybe these gentlemen can, anybody else who didn't get a question, maybe they'll talk to you. Bonham, be respectful of your time. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you to you. Thanks.